So today it's a great honor for me to introduce Dr. Brooks Mitchell. Dr. Mitchell taught this class from 1985? Yeah, about then, right. Through 2005, uh, yeah. 20 years. And he was and still is a legend in this college. Uh, everybody wanted to take this class when he was teaching it. And so when I called up, and I was in this class when he taught it in 1990, and uh, I just found some of my papers the other day, actually, and uh, um, it's funny how you develop as a human being. But anyway, um, it's really an honor for me to have him back here to talk to you because uh, my whole entrepreneur, entrepreneurial career started in this room. Uh, and then after I graduated, I ended up working for Dr. Mitchell. He was one of our first high-tech entrepreneurs here in Laramie. He started Aspen Tree Software and um, sold that for a lot of money and started another company, Snowfly. So here's a guy who raised four kids, successful family, successful business, and a very successful professor. So today, uh, Dr. Mitchell is gonna tell his story and uh, tell you all he knows about, well, tell you everything he knows about entrepreneurship would keep us here for a long time. But anyway, I'd like to okay. have you welcome Dr. Brooks Mitchell. Thank you. Hey, uh, I'll try to make this entertaining for you. But my first rule is, if you got to you turn them off, 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 off. No texting. If I see you texting, I will embarrass you. So forewarned is foretold. Okay. Um, now, first of all, I, uh, let's just go through these slides real quick. Um, this is kind of deja vu for me again. I started, started this course here at the university about 1986. And I'll tell you how I got to be here by life. I'd like to let you know right now that I am not, a, although I was a professor, I just happen to have a PhD. I am an entrepreneur to the bone, to the blood. I live it. I breathe it. It's the only way I could have made a success out of my life to be happy, to have the ultimate goal in life, which is P-O-M, and P-O-M stands for, all right, peace of mind. That's right. You have peace of mind and you got nothing. And I got peace of mind because, thank goodness, I realized I was not mentally insane when I was 30 years old because I thought I was. I thought, I am a sick puppy because I couldn't make it in the corporate world. And I had great jobs with Pepsi and Texas Census, which I'll tell you about briefly. But thank God Almighty, I had a career displacement, which most entrepreneurs do. Something just knocks them off their rocker and they do it and they achieve their destiny. And that's 15% of the American population. Maybe probably more in Wyoming and certainly more in this class, you wouldn't be in this class most likely. But if you're that 15%, which is really the only goal I would have for you in this class, the only goal that, that I had when I taught it, just when you walk out the door, have a pretty good feeling of who you are about that. Because if you are one, it's the only thing in this life you can do to get POM. And if you're not one, and you try to do it because you think it's like being a rock star and you're gonna get rich, okay, then you're gonna have a miserable life. It's, and it's not only, only you, it's gonna be like nuclear warfare and hand grenades. It's gonna, it's gonna kill everybody and wound everybody around you. So it's extremely important that you get a gra grasp on who you are. Some of the Hall of Famers in this class, Kevin Schaff, who I understand speaking to you very shortly. Yeah. Kevin Schaff, nerd, N-E-R-D, nerd, tell Kevin I said that, okay? But the guy had cojones made out of diamonds. I mean, he, he would walk into anybody at any time and talk about anything, and he was good. Kevin fooled me. You know, I had some videos. See, I get this video stuff done for you, Doc. I need, and I need some video stuff from Macy's department store chain out of New York. And I found out years later, I paid him like 2,000 bucks to do it. And I found out years later that Kevin wasn't doing it. He was getting his rummy fraternity brothers to do it and paying them $500, keeping $1,500 and making me happy. I loved it, man. I got what I wanted, they got what they wanted, you got what they wanted, what you wanted. Everybody's happy. Multi hundred or something million dollar business uh, these days, uh, just a wonderful man and you're very fortunate to have Kevin here. Next slide up here. For all of you Wyoming guys who want to start a hunting guiding business or something, well, it can be done. There's opportunities there. Huge opportunities. I'm going glamping myself in um, Idaho this summer, in July. Anybody know what glamping is? G-L-A-M-P-I-N-G? -G? Glamour camping, that's right. Okay, I'm a rich old fart. Kiss my butt, man, that's what I want. Okay, I mean, put me on the river. I don't, I've done all that for years, myself. 
I want to get off the boat, the bar's ready, the fire's going, you know, the guitars are playing, the tents are set up the floor, glamping, somebody figuring out social changes. Because opportunities in this world come not from technical changes, no. Most of you who do well in this life, who, what's your name? So you sure look like a former student. Jared. Jared, yeah, that's right, of course. God dang, good to see you, son. <laughs> yeah. Glad you came, man. Yeah. How's this? Real All right. Uh, so, uh, the, uh, but glamping, somebody figured out that uh, the, the, the changes of this life come from people who take technical changes and they figure out the social changes they cause. That's how you make a big fortune. Technical changes are like Apple and, and things like that, and you know, Microsoft, yeah, 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 it's possible. But it's the social changes where the for people who can recognize things are happening. Glamping, people like me, I still want to do it. Man, I love the outdoors. I can't get enough of the outdoors. Glamping, well, Brian up here, um, crazy rainbow, ugly bug, big hunting, fly fishing, out of Casper, hugely successful, maybe one of the most successful firms like that in the United States. A student here, next slide up here. DJ Davenport, Denver, Colorado, hugely successful mortgage firm. Started from scratch. Turns out his uh, business partner is my son-in-law, uh, which makes me even more fond of the business. But um, the uh, big business there, and they, they figured out different ways to do things. And they figured out a long time in the mortgage business that somehow or another you need to get special government type licensing this or whatever which opened up mortgage markets for them that had never been done before. And a highly successful business there. Next slide up here. Casey Bully. Love Casey. Casey, Flora, sat here in class, fell in love with each other, got to Hops and got married, still married today, uh, which is one of the great secrets of life. Keep your wife, keep your husband. By the way, I do know the secret to success of marriage. Anybody's curious. Having been married 48 years, and you probably want to tell I'm not the easiest person to be married to. Okay, what's the secret to marriage? Does anybody want to know? Nope. What? Don't get divorced. Well, that. Yeah. One house, one wife. We can lead you to prosperity for sure. But uh, so, uh, no, nah, the secret of marriage commitment? Nah, it had nothing to do with it. You know, respect? Probably not, I guess. I don't know. Marriage is 100% luck. Okay? Yeah, either get, it just works or it doesn't. Okay? So, what I'm saying is, you guys meet somebody at the cowboy bar or something like that, the buck fall in love, get married the next day to JP. It's got as good a chance anything as I know of working. Uh, I got lucky. Uh, so, uh, Casey in Flora up in uh, Hamilton, Montana. I didn't know he's up there. I go fishing up there every spring. Fly fishing is a, a big love of mine. And um, Casey went up there in a little town called Hamilton, which happens to be right in the Bitterroot Valley, which a huge, uh, um, the big stockbroker, Charles Schwab, moved in opened a big development like that, now suddenly Casey, Casey became on the early year in Montana about six or seven years ago, making beautiful marble cabinets and things. Next slide up there. Pro fantasy football. What the? Anybody ever heard of that one before? Any cowboys in here? Okay. KC Jones. KC down in Denver riding today. World champion cowboy. Pistol. Sometimes he came to class sober, sometimes he didn't. Uh, but Casey was a great athlete, great steer wrestler. He was a world champion steer wrestler about three or four years ago. He's down in, uh, been in Las Vegas many times. <coughs> great honor for me on a couple of occasions. Casey had me come to Las Vegas to the finals to sit with his parents and uh, watch him ride and everything. But Casey told me years ago, he said, hey, you know, Doc, you know, I don't want to be a busted up cowboy and be 40 years old and be broke. And he started Pro Fantasy Rodeo, which I guess I helped him a little bit, but uh, he did it himself and his wife. And uh, Pro Fantasy Rodeo, you can go online if you're a rodeo fan. There, there, are fan, there are hundreds of thousands of fans of rodeo just like the NFL, and you can go online, put up money, and pick ro fantasy rodeo teams for like the Denver Rodeo going on right now, and certainly the big one in Cheyenne, and, all of this, and it's just grown that into a highly successful business. Still riding, he's got a career, he's got a company. Casey was an entrepreneur, not a cowboy, or maybe both together. Next slide up here. Chris Kluver, crazy guy, uh, but I like crazy people. You know, you gotta be crazy to kinda make it work sometimes. Uh, Chris, right now, is uh, in Den uh, Omaha, Nebraska, social media. Oh, your text here, that's not his name. Uh, so, uh, Chris Kluver. And uh, Chris started several businesses, started one of the very first lycra riding, bicycle riding, skiing stuff, 
uh, company sold it, and now he's doing social media uh, consulting all around the world in Omaha. Next slide up here. JB's Welding Company. Boy, do I love JB. I mean, that Jim Bob. Okay? Hell, he doesn't even have a website. I called him and ate him out about that last night. Um, up in Pinedale, Wyoming. Grew up a ranch hands kid outside of Daniel. Anybody know where Daniel is? Huh? You guys don't live in Wyoming, don't you know where Daniel is? Well, he probably should not population about 20. Okay? Um, but uh, he rodeoed for a while and um, got um, busted up. Had to quit rodeoing. Professional PRCA rodeo guy and uh, moved back to Pinedale. Got a job wrangling. Uh, out there, the only thing he knew how to do, handle horses. Uh, a guy from Beverly Hills, rich guy, brought his family out. One of his daughters fell in love with J.B.'s Wrangler butt. Okay, and they got married. I think this had no chance of working. She moved to Pinedale about 12, 13 years ago. This can't possibly work. You know, he says, what are you going to do? He says, well, I bought me a welding truck. Well, they got married and kids now, and she loves it. And about five years ago, I'm playing golf. He's taking over golf, and I'm playing golf with Jim Bob down at Fort Collins, and they brought a bunch of his cowboy buddies down. I finally got up all my nerve on the 10th tee box. I said, JV, Jim Bob, how's that welding business doing? He said, oh, I did about $700,000 last year. I said, you did $700,000 over the business? And that one, he said, no, 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 that's what I made, okay? 200 employees, $200 million in sales right now. Just bought a beautiful ranch last summer, invited me up to go fishing. How long do you think it took me to say yes to that? <laughs> you know, JB, I was going to be up there tomorrow, come to think of it. And uh, going to build a golf course on the ranch there and play golf and fish. And so, next slide up here. Mike Christensen, Shoshone Lodge up there. Uh, big family squabble working for Dick Scarlett uh, in the bank, a job I helped him get there. He just wasn't a banker, thank goodness. And uh, wound up doing a whole lot of deals. Has now turned this into one of the most wonderful recreational lodges in the Rocky Mountain West. Next slide up there. And of course, the one and only Evan Brand here. Fresh from Norway, took my class. Um, we hit it off and eventually Evan wound up working for me. Uh, the company Aspen Tree and uh, one day several years ago got all his nerve up and came in my office shaking and I knew what this was about and he said I'm quitting you know and I'm gonna start my own business which you can't keep a good man down. You know my philosophy is give me a good man, a good woman for five years I'll take that and an average one for 25 years. Okay I want talent I found most of my talent in my career in this classroom right here. The people that just somehow or another had something about them, Evan, Kevin, and uh, many others in here that uh, frankly made me a fortune uh, over the years. So I'm going to tell you my story now, and I'll try to give you a few ins and outs in here, tips about your life, and hopefully if you determine that you're in that 15%, you know how you can achieve POM. I was born of a middle class family. My parents uh, grew up in poverty in the Depression in Oklahoma. Uh, born in 1943, which makes me 70. I'm having a hard time dealing with that. Uh, but uh, I don't look 70, do I? Okay, thank you. Uh, so anyway, I, um, I, had, but I grew up with great family values. And the values were number one, education. Now entrepreneurship was not something I understood at that point in time. But I did understand education from my grandparents who had college degrees. Uh, and then my parents both had college degrees. And every, all of my brothers and sisters. It was just something you did. And there was only one choice for me, I was going to Oklahoma State University. And that was it. I mean, they were just like you grew up in Wyoming many times. That was, their parents couldn't afford anything else. And it turns out that a very fine school just as Wyoming is an incredibly fine university that this state is so lucky to have. So I went to Oklahoma State University. And I did what all of my other classmates did. There were three choices. You can be a doctor, you can be a lawyer, you can be a nuclear engineer. So I chose a doctor. But I hated the labs. And I liked playing my guitar with a bottle of white wine or a loaf of French bread under a tree, swooning women. And by the way, guys, if you want to swoon women, learn how to play a guitar. Um, and I, had a, I, I liked school. I had a good time, man. I was, wow, this is wonderful. But uh, I just didn't like the labs and everything else. So I looked around and said, what can I possibly major in that would be the easiest thing for me to get a degree at this university? I said, English literature. That's it. That's me right here. 
I can BS my way to, I like to read, I know all this stuff anyway. And so I got a degree in English literature with a grade point average of 2.0001. I mean, got out by the skin of my teeth. But it didn't matter because that was 1965. And in 1965, you were a male and you were ambulatory, there's only one option. What was it? Goodbye, darling. Hello, Vietnam. That's it, baby. Everybody was going. It didn't matter what was going on. So I went down for my physical. I was going to be a jet pilot. Going to get me out of that pass. Give me a little white uniform, gold braids on it, you know. Get a little salt spray in my face coming into port. You know, a pocket full of money and be a rich American walking around over there like that's what I was going to do. And a doctor saw me just totally coincidentally and said, You got dry skin, son. I said, That's right. So, well, what do you do for it? I said, nothing. He wrote something on a paper that goes to show that guy over there. I went to the guy, he said, what's up? He said, man, you're out. I'm out of the military? I don't have a job. He said, well, you're out. Well, he said, um, you're, you're drafted for this 1Y. I knew what 4F was. I said, what's 1Y? He said, that's worse than 4F. And I said, well, am I going to go into the military? He said the famous words. He said, son, if those Vietnamese invade California, and get to Oklahoma, we might call you up. And I said, well, I'm going to take a chance that's not going to happen. You know? So I had to get a job. Now, in the meantime, in 1964, I made my first trip to Wyoming. Met my wife up in Jackson Hole. She asked me, I had two fish. She said, hey, cowboy, why don't you take me fishing? Damn right I will. Uh, so, uh, you know, I got you. You know, but um, anyway, that was quite, we had a very rocky, stormy relationship. I mean, it was off again. Everybody thinks she's sweet. She's meaner than a devil. Uh, but uh, we, we made it. You know, still married 48 years later. Uh, but anyway, so I decided I wanted to court her a little bit. So I had, had, got me a job selling beauty supplies in Ogden, Utah. She was going to school at BYU. Don't let that offend anybody uh, in here. But she was a good little Mormon girl. And I said, I want to marry her. So I got me a job selling beauty cosmetics door to door. You know, it's only a job. What's this all about? Well, I lasted about three weeks at that. And then I found out that I could get a job because I had a degree at the um, uh, Salt Lake County Detention Center, locking kids up 11 o'clock at night to uh, 8 o'clock in the morning was my shift, or 7 o'clock in the morning. Had to call her parents that came in. Hello, Mr. Christensen? Yes. This is Brooks Mitchell at Salt Lake County Detention Center here. Uh, do you have a daughter named Pamela? Well, yes, I do. Well, we have her down here at the detention center. She's like this, barfing and everything. And I said, well, um, oh, no, no, she's asleep in her room upstairs. I said, well, Mr. Christensen, I'm, I, that may be the case, but why don't you just go check just to be sure, you know, and you just count one, two, three, four. Oh, my God! And runs to the phone, and it'll be right now. So anyway, that's what I did. You know, that was sad. I didn't like that. I didn't like emotional trauma. Then luck, L-U-C-K, luck. Luck happens in life. But you've got to be on the playing field to get lucky. You know, I always like to tell the story, big game, you know, whatever, Super Bowl game or whatever, like, I don't know, college game. Some big, fat, 355-pound offensive lineman sitting there on fourth and goal with the clock running out, scratching his butt out there. Play happens, quarterback fumbles the ball, ball jumps up in the air, he turns around, what does he have in his hands? He's got the football. He turns around at 350 pounds to start doing this towards the goal line with 10 guys hanging all over him, and he crosses the goal line as the clock runs out. Wyoming wins. Okay, was he lucky? Probably. But you know what else he was? He was on the playing field. So if you want to get it going in life, you've got to get on the field sooner or later. You can't stay back, kind of put your toe in, put your toe in, put your toe in. That only works a little bit. You've got to jump out there. So luck does happen. I got lucky. I got a phone call from a friend. He said, Bubba, have you ever heard of a company called Texas Instruments? I said, well, yeah. Don't they make transistor radios? Well, they make a lot of stuff. They were a big electronics firm. Some of you, I'm sure most of you have heard of TI. It, I couldn't have, they wouldn't have hired me at a bet. But I had a college degree and I had a draft deferment, and they hired me to be a first line supervisor at night, supervising 120 women. That was a trip. And uh, doing assembly work with little lights. But I, I learned about human behavior, I learned about delegation. Uh, I liked that part of it. But on third shift, I learned something else, too. Nobody messes with you. 
And Texas Instruments had a great program called Educational Systems, which I found you can go to any college you want to that you can qualify for, and we'll pay your books and tuition. If you make an A, we'll reimburse you 90%. B, 80, C, 70, D, you pay for it. I said, any school? I said, they said, yes. I said, Southern Methodist University? Very expensive, private school. And they said, sure. So I go trotting down to SMU and say, I want to get in your MBA program. It was five years ago, and they said, you cut a 2.001 grade average English. You know, that doesn't cut it. I said, yeah, but look what I did on my GMAT scores here. I said, well, sorry. Take some remedial. So I took 60 hours of remedial business courses to qualify. Because I could do it during the day, get off work, okay? Go down to SMU, start taking classes about 8 o'clock. Quit taking classes about 1 o'clock. Go home, put blinders on my sleep till my wife got off of her job. About 7 o'clock, I'd get up, would have dinner, whatever, go back to bed again, and the hardest part was getting up out of two more hours later and going to work. But I did that for six years and eventually got an MBA at SMU. And they asked me to teach there, and I liked it. Uh, so, uh, but in the meantime, um, then as soon as I finished the MBA, one of my old bosses, I'd left TI, and um, uh, before that, my old boss called me up and said, hey, I'm working for Pepsi. Why don't you come up and be head of HR for an edition in Tulsa? I said, okay, I'll do that. Great job, mate. Man, that was great. I'd been working for Texas Instruments, you know, there was a very downplayed, no suit and suits. Also, I'm wearing suits, I got a private office. Defined how big my desk was, how many paintings I could have in the office, all that. I got a private secretary, I got a car, I got a country club membership, and I got something else. I started the sense. Those guys were hooking me up with golden handcuffs. And I saw it happen to other guys. They're making this so good, I can't leave it. And I didn't like that feeling. And I started really not to like corporate America. I'd get these job interviews. Brooks, ambitious, bright, creative, all this, and then a three-letter word would say what? But, need to be a team player? Okay, send me to team player school. Okay, where do I go? I, I'm going to be a team player. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start, you know, but I'm thinking, I'm smarter than you. I thought that. And by the way, guys, uh, on that subject, some of you may already be thinking this, that I am one arrogant SOB. And there's probably some truth to that. Okay? You shaking your head yes? I'm not that arrogant. It's okay if you are. You know? <laughs> but, no, uh, I'm, I'm for the Seahawks, by the way. So, uh, the, uh, but, it's, it's, I don't, hope you won't interpret it that way. It's just me. And I want you to see me, that's what I want my students to see. And if you're a real entrepreneur, you'll understand it. If you're not an entrepreneur, you, you will think arrogant SOB. But if you are an entrepreneur, you'll understand what I'm talking about here. I didn't like what we were and I didn't, and they were getting me back. And so when my boss called me in one day, just over something incidental, and just started up and down one side, this and that, my head almost blew off on my, I was about to blow up. And I'm sitting there listening to him. I won't say the word in this class, I used to say it class. But when he said, finally, do you have anything to say? I said, go F yourself. Okay, well that pretty much ended my career at Pepsi. Uh, <laughs> but I did it intentionally. I know I did it intentionally. You know, I want, I want to make this, he said, what? And we got up and we are bumping chest. Okay? What did you say to me? I mean, I said, go F yourself again, in case I didn't get it right the first time. You know? <laughs> so, anyway, uh, Everybody was sad. My wife was just, you know, panicking. My guy, we got kids, they're pregnant. Um, you know, what are we going to do? I said, honey, I, I heard when I walked out that door. First of all, I went out to see the company who kind of liked me, but he knew their attention. He said, well, we'll get you a job in San Francisco. I said, Dick, I'm, I messed it up pretty bad. And he said, what can I do for it? Can you just keep me on a payroll for six months and keep my benefits going for a year? At that point in time, you only get one chance. When you get in that situation, they will say anything to get you out of that office because they're uncomfortable too. And he said, okay. So I'm walking out. I swear, I swear I heard, looked up, the clouds parted. And there was a Mormon Tabernacle Choir saying, hallelujah. I said, I'm thinking, yeah, I am free. I am free. I did it. And I called a buddy. Went duck hunting the next day. That was back before Duck Dynasty. Uh, but um, so I went out duck hunting. And I just, I loved it. Now I had some ideas about consulting work. I said, I hooked up with a former boss of mine who has a PhD in industrial psychology from Purdue. And so I started doing consulting work uh, in, in Dallas, Texas. Just about a thing I knew at TI. 
you know, how to treat people nice, all this. And I could go and come when I wanted to, and I had lots of free time. I said, man, I can do something with this free time. And I just started, all of a sudden, I'm making three times as much money, but it wasn't about money. And it never, and by the way, guys, it's about money, you guys ain't gonna work. It can't be about money. It's gotta be about your heart. That's what my heart was. I'm free, I'm me. I get to do what I want to do. I mean, within a reason, I'm not gonna break any laws or be immoral, but I get to be me. So anyway, I built that business up and I doing a lot of work out west with the coal mines and all this other stuff and years ago, all kinds of things. Somebody brought me a touchscreen computer back when they were, they would just go down. And I started building those things into kiosks and putting them in hotel and bank lobbies retail store lobbies and, and uh, all of this. And then one day I got an idea. Something I'd learned about in my PhD, by the meantime I was working on a PhD at uh, North Texas University uh, and commuting there because I had time, I could go and all of this. And I decided, well, if I'm gonna be in the consulting business, I should be Dr. Mitchell, not Mr. Mitchell. So I did that and uh, it was fun, it was easy. Uh, it just took a lot of time, I had to write a dissertation. But I heard about this process called credit scoring. Credit scoring for uh, people like you'd credit score for a bank loan. Only you'd go back and look at people's job application blanks for a company and you would take good application hires over here and bad hires over here and then you'd go through and code them like were they employed, you know, how long, last job, education, put little numbers down and run a program that I had somebody built for me and I would build a statistical profile and I sold that to companies. And I kept driving back and forth, back and forth, this little strip mall in Dallas. And there's a sign up there that said, computer sold here. I'm thinking, you've got to be kidding me. Computers are sold by guys for millions and millions of dollars. That's what they are, that's what they were then. Well, it was computer land. And I walked in and said, show me that computer. It was an Apple II computer. Didn't even have a disk drive. That time I had to get a tape recorder for it. I said, what can this do? He said, well, it can balance your checkbook, you know, if you water your lawn, you know, manage your thermostat. And I said, balance my checkbook, I go see the bank president and secretary and say, here, balance this. And she does it. Water my lawn, I just flip the switch and that's it. And thermostat, I just hit a switch and I don't need that. But then I got to thinking, one of the problems with my scoring deal, I made up a little scoring key and I sent it out to managers all of the United States for different companies and they would they knew what the scoring key was, so they would, they would fudge it. They would say, if going to school was important, maybe you get two points if you're going to school, they would say to Sally, you know, are you going to school? You know, and then maybe no Sally, dad should say, no, he said, now Sally, I saw you at Sunday school. Oh, I guess I am, bang, two points. So then I thought, well maybe that Apple computer could hide that coding key. How would you do that? Pe people can't run a computer. Man, that's big time stuff. I said, well, I bet they can. So I went down to a picture frame store and had them cut me a mat with a little sharp blade there and cut a little hole so that the mat would lay over the keyboard. And then I ordered some decals, just plain old decals, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, M, Q, next question, and I put those on there. And I'd go get Billy Ray Johnson's name, he will apply for a job, type it in Billy Ray, and he'd sit down at the computer and they would say, is your name Billy Ray plus A for you have need to go, my gosh, how does it know my name? Scary, spooky. But I would collect that information. And then I learned something else. So I sold that. I was the first person in the history of this world to ever set a job applicant in front of a computer and apply for a job. And I did that in 1977. Okay? Me, I did it with an Apple computer. People thought I was overwhelmed. I got thrown out of offices. Never in my lifetime will this happen. But then I realized something. You know what? Those little floppy disks that we had then? I said, if you will send these disks to me, I will build an ongoing professor. It was just awful. And he said, what would you do? I said, well, I'd fire the guy. <laughs> he said, well, Brooks, at Harvard, we say that men are like diamonds. Leaders are like diamonds. They're forged under great pressure. And I said, well, let me tell you what we say at Wyoming. We say you can't make chicken salad out of chicken shit, okay? And that's where, so that pretty much did not ingratiate me to some of the Harvard guys or anything. But anyway, so I said, well, this internet, you put your ads up there, people find it. 
You don't have to do brochures anymore. But how do they communicate? Well, they got computers. Well, what kind of computer? Any kind of computer. What, what, I'm not a computer person at all. I mean, I know nothing about I have very little of them and can tell you. Okay, but, but I was talking about a server. I didn't know what I was doing. You know, this. So wait a minute. If they're going to the internet and they can do it on an IBM PC computer or an Apple computer, then there must be some central place where all this gets fixed. Right. So I called the guys up at the office and they said, Bubba, that's what we've been trying to tell you about for the last several years. Or two or three year months or whatever. I said, well, I said, guys, you got my attention now. You want to show you how it works? I said, what can you show me? I want you coming home. I said, I'll come home right now. I will have it working for you. I got on the next plane in Santa Monica, came back to Denver, drove to Laramie, midnight, go to my office, and they showed me. I said, boys, you know, one of the great things when you own a business, like I say, you can grab the sports page, the Sports Illustrated, or whatever like that. You can go down to the bathroom and make a decision. You don't have to involve anybody else in this. And I said, Dan, we're getting in that business now. So I became a very early pioneer in that internet monster board type stuff, building system here with these guys, selling it. Evan was a great salesman, by the way. He could, he could sell the stuff. And the money was coming in. I mean, it was gushing in to Laramie, friggin' Wyoming up here. I, I mean, it was great. And um, so it, Evan left the company again going, all of a sudden, very few entrepreneurs, and I'm not one of them. I think Bill Gates might have been one, Steve Jobs might have been one, not me. Very few entrepreneurs have the ability to start something and make it grow and then run it once it gets big. And I started feeling this thing just, you know, people came to me and they wanted, they wanted employee manuals. What? What do you mean you want an employee? Well, we need to know what our vacation, your vacation strategy is. If you need to take a vacation, take it. You know? So it gets your job done. Well, she takes all, you know, it's just like, it's all. Anyway, went to Boston. I talk to anybody. I'm not a secretive person. I go to Boston one time and I talked to a, a former client here. He wanted to have breakfast with me and he was a nerd and I wasn't particularly interested in doing it, but <laughs> what the heck? What time is it, Evan? It's a uh, quarter All right, we're in good shape. So I, um, I go to breakfast. He said, okay, yeah. He said, I'm uh, now U.S. president for this British company called SHL Savile and Holdsworth, and they really want to get in this internet selection business. They're a giant worldwide testing business throughout the U.K., the empire, and um, I think you'd be interested in buying your company. Okay, I'm interested then. What's the deal? So I went to breakfast with him. Well, then, he said the chairman's going to be here in, in uh, two weeks uh, in Louisville. He could meet with you then. I said, well, okay. So um, prior to the chairman coming out, he sent one of his minions out, a lady from England, the old Nyfield. Had her, I did this intentionally. I had her fly, it was in the wintertime, I had her fly into Cheyenne, okay, so I could take her back Happy Jack Road. Okay, I really played up the Western stuff big. I was wearing boots and hats. And, you know, and turn on that accent just a little bit. And uh, so, uh, you know, I was, I was seducing her, okay? And not that way, but I mean, I was putting, I, I, every ounce of Oki charm I had, boy, I mean, I was about a five year, 55 gallon drum of that stuff all over her. And I brought her in, and I had all the people come in and meet Jill and show her what we're doing. And, you know, theory behind it and she said, well this is brilliant, this is, that's what the Brits say, all I can say is brilliant, 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 brilliant. <laughs> right, so, okay, so I go meet Roger in Louisville and uh, he shows up in a pair of baggy pants and a, a strap t-shirt, about half hung over and we sat there and talked and you know, a real interesting guy and uh, so he said, well I think we can do this and um, deal, so um, he said, you need to come um, to England and meet with the board. Okay, I can do that. So um, I can't believe what I did next. I called him on the phone two days before I came. I said, Roger, um, before I come over there, there's a couple things that we need to, you know, that are really non-negotiable with me that we need to get this clear right now, otherwise I don't want to take your time up or mine. Uh, number one, is there will not be any buyout. I hate buyouts. You guys know what a buyout is? 
where they pay you now and they just keep paying you over time. Because once it'll earn, earn out, we'll pay you based on what the company does. Because once they do that, I mean, it's now it's an accounting game. You know, this, that, well, you put $5 million budget here. I said, number two, uh, I need to have at least this much money for it, and I put a lot of zeros on that number out there. He said, that's fine. So, whew, damn. Okay. So we go over there, I meet with the board. Once again, I mean, I charmed those Brits. They, there's just something about being a cow. I mean, guys, I was, do you want me to be a cowboy? I'll be a cowboy. I mean, I get over there and I've got buckskin hanging out and silver. Oh, I should have worn some of those uniforms for you today. You know, and alligator boots and, <coughs> and all this. And uh, I've got a bottle of Jack Daniel and fill it up with iced tea. You know, start sipping on it, whatever. <laughs> They ask me a question, I go, oh, man, that's a hard, I got a drink for that question. You know? And they're just sitting here <laughs> like it. But, you know, obviously I knew exactly what I was doing. So when the meeting was over, they did a little applause like this. And Roger says, the chairman, says, let's go back in the room. Now these Brits are funny people, man. So we sit in this room in there, and he won't come up with a number. So finally he gets around and says, well, we're thinking about this. And he goes to a blackboard and he writes a number up there. Folks, that was a number. <laughs> yeah, okay, no problem. But somehow or another, a little fairy spoke to me and I went up and added two more num digits on a number. And he said, okay. And I just made $2 million in that five seconds right there. Extra. Okay, on top of everything else. I was like, Wow. I mean, I was like stunned by all of this. And my wife wasn't with me. I'm trying to convince honey, we're rich, baby. You know? <laughs> I, told you, I told you you hang out with old Bubba. Someday you'll be wearing diamonds bigger than horse turds if you want. Uh, you know? I did it. I mean, it was there. And this, this is not, spe these guys are on the stock exchange. This is not speculation. This is real like this. Well, I had to tell somebody. So I go down to Saville Row and, uh, London to a place called Holland and Holland where they sell, you know, the official supplier to the king and the prince of hunting stuff. And did a little shopping down there, you know. How much is that shirt? Five hell, five hundred bucks? Hell, I'll take it. What else you got over here, you know? Fourteen hundred dollars for a shell case I was gonna go show off to all my buddies quail hunting down in Texas and all this stuff. So anyway, this British guy, I'll never forget it. I've written a lot about this and I really, I do believe this is true. This British kid said, and he's waiting on me. And, well, I had to tell somebody. I just had to tell. So I tell him, and I mean, oh my. And then he said the words that I've never forgotten. Might I ask you something, sir? Yes. Were you born of lowly circumstances? And I, <laughs> there's a class system over there. They don't get it. Right, Ed? I mean, when you came to the United States, you didn't even have a clue you'd run your own business someday. Was, you know, most of these guys go back and get a job working for the government in, in Norway and in, in Scandinavia. God bless them, you know? But, um, you know, and so, yeah, I did that. I came back, um, and I signed a contract with them, a no-fault contract. And that was, um, I'll tell you this number, but the number was, you have to pay me $350,000 a year just to stay around here in Laramie. And that goes a long way in this little town. You can do a lot of that at Walmart here. And uh, so, a little humor, guys, come on. So, um, anyway, I uh, did that, and um, but I knew it wasn't going to work because I'm just not management material. I knew that from Pepsi and Texas systems. And so, the no fault deal was I can quit anytime I want. You owe me 350 You can fire me. You can fire me because you just didn't like the color of shirt I wore one day. You don't need a reason. It says in the contract, you fire me, you owe me 350 well, after about nine months, I couldn't take it anymore. I just said, I quit. And um, by the way, when I did sold the company, there were a lot of very happy employees in Laramie, Wyoming. I took about a million dollars and just, here guys, take it. And all of a sudden, it was a good deal. It was a great day for the car salesman in this town, pickup salesman, I should say. And uh, so um, anyway, uh, that's what I did. Um, I hung out. Um, Started another company, uh, a golfing company um, online. Uh, that didn't work out. I didn't understand that business. Uh, I lost a little money there, not much. And then I started Snowfly, um, which is the business that I'm in 
Ryan now if you want to look it up online sometime, send me an email or whatever, I'd love to get to know you. S-N-O-W-F-L-Y, an internet gambling idea that I had. And it's doing very well. Um, we have an office, still have an office here in Laramie, one in Fort Collins now. And Snowfly is basically, and if I asked you a question, if you had a, uh, um, I don't know, if I said, if you put your finger, put your finger on your nose for me, just hold it right there for three seconds. One, right? One, two, three. Okay. Now, a little psychology lesson. A very specific observable behavior, right? You either did it or you didn't do it. If you did it, then suppose I said to you, I'll give you, um, right now, I'll either uh, give you a dime for doing that, or I'll let you spin a wheel that you can get someplace between two cents or fifty dollars right now. It'll average out to be a dime. What would you do? Take the dime or spin the wheel? How many of you spin the wheel? All right, anybody take the dime? Good, or nobody's sick in here. That's good. Uh, so, yeah, and that's my theory that people that job for rewards it, it's more fun than to play a quick game, game of chance, roulette type game, Las Vegas game. And so, uh, we do that for giant companies like Blue Cross, Blue Shield, Hyatt Hotels, um, Avis Car Rental, uh, Reader's Digest. Uh, my favorite one, Wyoming boys, I have none other than Sig Sauer as a customer. You guys know Sig Sauer Sigs? Uh, the preferred gun of who? The Navy SEALs. Speaking of the SEALs, I've had a couple of SEALs in class. Uh, one of my uh, former students I stayed in touch with, Chris Fonis from Wheatland, uh, was on the rescue team that rescued Marcus Luttrell. And, uh, uh, and I've been on touch with him quite a bit in the last few weeks. A great young man. Wanted to be a flyer. Um, for some reason, he didn't get into to, uh, Officer Canada School, enlisted in the military out of his class uh, as an enlisted man, worked his way up, and he'll be a lieutenant colonel here in about two months. And commands several helicopters over in Afghanistan right now. A real warrior. So, um, Snowfly, my uh, company, I um, um, took the Got all the money out of it, everything and more. That more clean. I couldn't quit, and uh, so I started Snowfly. I did that. Uh, my son um, and uh, is the president of the company, and, and doing a good job. Not me, uh, but he's doing a good job. I mean, not me. That's not bad or good. He just is more of an administrator. And uh, but we're doing very, 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 very good business. And I don't know, I got so many other business ideas. I wish I knew some of you kids right now and say, guys, I got some business ideas that cannot lose. I mean, they just can't lose. And let me tell you where there's opportunities. Where there is chaos, there's opportunity. Well, where's the frickin' chaos? Chaos. Chaos. chaos? Healthcare. Man, there's fortunes to be made out there legally. A lot of them are gonna be done illegally, probably already are. I mean, there are so many ways to make money in healthcare. There have to be, I don't know what they are. But there have to be entrepreneurial opportunities there in healthcare. There are other deals out. Uh, I, I don't know what they are. Uh, and I've got my own ideas for businesses and things. But there's one right now. Man, if I were your age, I'd be looking at healthcare. I'd understand how that system works. You know what I'd do? I want to get in that business? I'd go get me a job. I'd get me a job for Blue Cross or some big bureaucratic hospital system like that and watch how they screw it up, okay, because they do screw it up, okay? Well, figure out how they screw it up and then fix it for them, okay? And make a fortune, do it. But not only make the fortune, fulfill yourself. Be one of that 15%, okay? Because if you don't do it and that's you, it's not going to work. I made a little list of some suggestions here that I like to tell people that are good advice and then we'll open it up for questions. You all are poor now. I know you're poor. Okay? I've seen students go to all-you-can-eat pizza with sneaking in a garbage bag. You know, I've seen it before. Uh, and that's okay. My, my advice to you is stay poor. Don't go out and get into debt. I don't think you need a lot of money. In fact, if you too much money in starting a business is a bigger problem than not enough money. Because if you got too much money, what will you do, Jared? You'll spend it. Huh? You go spend it. Instead of doing it yourself and making it work and figuring out solutions. So stay poor. 
You know, people will help you. They will help you because you're young. I won't help you because I'm old, you're young. I want to pass this on. My genetics are like the old elk in the herd. They need to be passed on, so to speak. And I want to help you. I mean, I want to help people. Get out and do it. Because we, as Oxford Earth, are the greatest social benefactor of the planet Earth. The government gets out and they talk about, oh, we love entrepreneurship. Oh, you are such phony. Yeah, you love entrepreneurship, but you know what you don't like? You don't like the entrepreneur. You like the hundreds of jobs that I've created, and Evan. I mean, that's, Evan and I are responsible for millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars in Wyoming, in this economy. Yeah, create jobs, that's what we do. Understand that. We might make some money at it. We might lose our butts, too. Okay? There's no guarantee out there. However, I believe the true entrepreneurs have about an 85 to 90 percent success rate. You hear all these statistics: 15 percent success rate. That's bullshit. Okay, if you're an entrepreneur, okay, and you got the stuff, you got an 85 percent chance. Right? Stay poor. Okay, create jobs. Uh, the um, other thing is um, the get up every morning and do this with your hand in the mirror. Just do that, you don't have to do it in the mirror. What, what letter is that? That's the letter L. What does L stand for the rest of your lives? Leverage, okay? Whatever you do, figure out a way to leverage yourself. Okay, so that you can literally make money while you sleep. Getting monthly income, as Ab does, as I do a snowfly, we have, you know, we pay our bill just off of money. We don't even have to go to work, and the money comes in every month. Eventually, we've got to do something for that money. But, you know, we don't have to keep selling it because people pay us monthly fees and stipends to stay engaged with us. It's leverage. If you go out and just do one thing, it's very hard to leverage being an attorney. It's very hard to leverage, you know, uh, being a car mechanic uh, and things like that. But it, easy, it is easy to leverage um, you know other types of things where so when you sell something even if you just get a little bit of income coming in a perpetual basis next advice um, I can't put your toe in there are three stages to the truth I didn't invent this but it's one of my favorite quotations by Fritz Hoppelheimer some crowd from Germany or something like that philosopher stage one okay you come up with something new you will be ridiculed. Okay? Stage two, if you get past stage one, after you get past being ridiculed, you will be violently opposed. And if you get past stage two to stage three, you will be widely accepted as having been self-evident. I knew it all along. I can't tell you how many times, I knew you'd do it, Brooksy. Oh, really? How come you threw me out of your office and I told you a computer could interview a person? How about when I said people could play games that work productively? You know, that's a, such a common idea these days. We are all in sales. Okay? Anybody becomes an entrepreneur that thinks they're not selling is wrong. You know what I'm selling? You know you can tell what I'm selling? My lips are moving. Okay, if my lips are moving, I'm selling. Okay, I love getting on the airplane next to people. I love playing golf with people and waiting for them to say, what do you do? I tell them what I do, and I get business that way. Um, Lack of money is good. Prepare for rejection. And when you get out of the school, go to work for a big company for a while. Just learn their ways. Calm down a little. You know, start eating a whole pizza at the table instead of putting it in the garbage bag for a while. All right? Gather ideas. Keep files and things. Well, that's pretty much what I had to say to you. I do have one closing story, but I'll tell you that uh, when Evans, that anybody might have some questions. Well, I really appreciate you talking, Brooks, and it's amazing. I've known this man for 25 years, and I still learn new things today, stories I haven't heard. I thought I heard Paul, but I <laughs> certainly haven't. Um, we have time for questions, so anybody have questions for Brooks? I have some questions, but you guys go first. Okay, Brooks, one thing I always seem amazed by, because I'm still in my first business, why do so many entrepreneurs, when they made their millions, and they could retire, don't have to work, why do they start another business? Because it's in your blood. That's what you do. I mean, that's what you do. That's who you are. Now, the, the thing about the big mistake that many entrepreneurs have made, uh, I knew Frank Carney, who founded Pizza Hut, who 30 years ago uh, got $300 million from Pepsi for Pizza Hut. 
Okay, he had a Coke sign out in front of the original Pizza Hut, which is all Kansas. It's a Pepsi sign now. Uh, but um, so Frank Carney got $300 million and lost every nickel of it. Okay, why? Because he felt like if I'm good at this, then I'm good at this, this, and this. The old advice stick to your knitting, stick to what you know. When I got in that golf program, I didn't know what I was doing, and I screwed up. I'm in a business, I, I understand golf and all this, but I got in a business, I didn't understand the dynamics of that. Okay, I loved the idea, I fell in love with the idea. And that was a mistake. Snowfly, I understand. Okay, Aspen Tree, I understood. Uh, by the way, I changed the company the name from Green Tree to Aspen Tree, so I'd have a mountain look. I mean, all of our marketing was just pure cowboy Wyoming mountain. So, anyway. What other questions do we have for Brooks? How do you know when to go into that new venture? What's that? How do you know to go into that new business? I mean, once you hit your limit, like you said, you couldn't, you couldn't really manage, so you kind of switched and got to a new venture. Oh, you, know? you get cranky, you know? Uh, you assume everybody thinks like you think. Um, it would just irritate the hell out of me if I saw like one or two employees would leave the office promptly at noon for lunch, come back at 1.15, leave promptly at 4.30. Well, on the surface, that doesn't bother me, but I mean, how do you, how do you structure your job like that? This is a 24-7 deal with me. So it just got, uh, got out of hand um, and it became kind of frustrating and I got the right opportunity. Um, you know, I love the business and I love the employees and it was Snowfly. Uh, the right opportunity comes along, I'll do it again. Um, you know, I'll give it my son and say, hey son, you know, what do you think? And here's the deal. So, you know, the question is how do you know when you can get in? Okay, and um, that's just, I don't know, there's kind of a feeling in you. I mean, you, you suck it up, baby. I mean, it's like, what I say is, um, you know, um, I, love, I just got back from a week of war. I love war history. I mean, I, if you ask me anything about war, I know. Well, what are we coming up on the 100 year anniversary of here in August? Kapoom, huh? World War I, Sarajevo, Archduke Ferdinand, right? Kapoom, changed the whole world today, screwed us up today. I just got back from a week long tour of uh, New Orleans, the World War II Museum, Savannah, 8th Air Force Museum, and then Kansas City um, three days ago with the World War I Museum. So, uh, but I mean, when you get in business, baby, you gotta get on the field, you put your parachute on, you take a deep breath, and you jump. A little quick story that I'll get to your question. When I got into whitewater rafting, at the high class five level, I went through, I mean, any of you guys ever been, women been through lunch counter up on the Snake River outside of Jackson, lunch counter rapids? Okay, it was high deal, and it came time for me, I said, all right, I'm ready to go. I went through five times with the guy and memorized every oar motion. And it was, I mean, it, you know, it was a high deal like that. And um, I did it, and you reach a point in the vortex of the river, up until then you say, you know what, I could pull over right now, anchor my raft to a rock, climb up the canyon, and get the hell out of here. But you reach a point, it doesn't matter if we're in nuclear war with the Russians right now, I'm going through those rapids. I got to do it. I'm out. I jumped out of the airplane. I got to make it work. It's scary, but you got to believe in yourself. And when I finished getting to those rapids, I'm still upright. I had a rush. I've never done dope before. Well, I take it back. I did once. Okay, I was a Colorado for guy. I had bad muscles, uh, so uh, I try a little marijuana, but that didn't work. But I mean, you know, they say you get a big rush off of cocaine. I don't know what that would be like, but I had a rush. I mean, it, it was like wow. Selling that business, that was the blessed event of my life. Like, wow, that was a validation that everything I've done, everybody who's crapped on me, everybody who's turned me down, every, you know, humiliation I've had to, to suffer here, everything has made whole now. And when we signed the papers, I had gone to South Africa and found a 2.1 perfect carat diamond. I shouldn't tell the story. I always get emotional. But that was Miss Vicky's reward for putting up with my crap. Anyway, what's your question? Oh, Somebody had a question back here. Oh, that was okay, sir. Yes. I actually have a question. All right. Okay. right. What's that? Okay. Well, my question isn't going into pharmacy, and I'm kind of. You're a pharmacist? No, I'm in the mutual MBA pharmacy program. Okay. Taking these business classes, whether having a private pharmacy would be a good 
honey, I can tell you what to do. And you can't report me for calling you honey because I don't work here anymore. <laughs> so, you know, uh, just said, bring them on, bring them on, like that. Um, I've had many pharmacists in this class. Three of them one time got crop in the front row. Started taking me on in class. And uh, there were three of them, you know, and I, man, they were getting laughing and taking me on, challenged me. And I walked up and all of a sudden I felt like I'd walked in the buckhorn. You know, I said, what the little cups you're drinking there? And I found out real fast. <laughs> Biggest problem, yeah, he didn't share it with me. Uh, but um, pharmacy, pros and cons. Um, the, um, I wish I could think of her name now. The, obviously you get out of here, you go to the pharmacy, 100 grand a year, more, whatever. Good job, good life, get a job in Cleveland, Wyoming, or, you know, have a great life. I mean, there's nothing, absolutely nothing wrong with that. But you're going to be pushing pills all day, too, you know. And I, I use pharmacies a lot. I'm a diabetic. I use them a lot. And um, so, you know, it, it's a great life. I, I don't want to downplay it at all. But if I were going to be a pharmacist like the uh, young lady up in uh, Lander, Wyoming, and I'm not sure what she did, but she called me, and um, there's, a, there's two pharmacies in Lander, one of them's at Costco or well, not Costco, Walmart or Pam Ida or whatever it is up there. And then there was the old pharmacy downtown. And she had a chance to buy the, the pharmacy downtown. I said, man, I'd buy that pharmacy downtown. Because now you can, you can express yourself there. You can treat people like real customers in here. And you can build the business your way. And by the way, Walmart can't really compete with you on drugs because they're pretty much all the same price. So now you've got that advantage. I'd bring people, and I, I don't know if she ever did it, I tried to talk her into buying a little desktop um, uh, convection oven. I, I, I like to cook, and I, I mean, I'm good too, by the way. And I don't know that that's right. But I said, why don't you make dog biscuits here? Dog cookies. Fresh dog cookies. Everybody, everybody, everybody in Lander, if you don't have a dog, you're nothing in that town. You know, everybody come in and bring their dog in and give them a hot cookie. Like that. So, I mean, there's opportunities there to be an entrepreneur. And by the way, pharmacies suck. I mean, in terms of business. Oh, my God. I mean, um, yeah, how they're they just are awful. They're just they're just uh, they're, they're just awful. I mean, um, you know, I can't why can't I communicate some way via my pharmacy? A little lockbox there, a little special code, slide my card in, get my drugs, pay my bill instead of standing in line by you know Ma Frickard or something like that who's up here. You know, bless her heart, but I mean this and that and everything else, and I'm going crazy. Okay. Because I have no patience. I mean, it's steel on steel. I've been known, you know, back in the old days, I teach here, if you guys want to get free food at McDonald's, you got to get free food at McDonald's, get in front of me a line and start writing a check. Okay, that's how you're going to get free food. Because I'm going to say, get the hell out of here. I'm paying for it. Go. Leave. Okay, and I've done that before. Uh, I just can't deal with it. So, yeah, there's, there's tremendous pharmacies. You know, and you know why they do it that way? Because everybody else did it that way. You can make a fortune in pharmacy. A fortune in pharmacy. Those of you who were in my class last week, remember I said uh, most entrepreneurs I know has zero, about this much patience. This is exhibit A right here. <laughs> <laughs> we have time for one Bill, more Bill designer drugs, by the way. Okay? One last question. Designer drugs. Brooks. Okay, last sorry. Question. Designer drugs. I'll tell you about how that works. I want some. Okay? Um, here, that's my other question. Yeah. You said uh, that good, good people are hard to come by drugs. It has get them five years and then they move on. You can give some insight in regards to management or as an entrepreneur finding that talent that makes your business successful. Sure. So you're the visionary, but you need great people to make that. Sure. Business. First of all, I hire people, not skills. I've never hired skills. I mean, so I take it back. For computer developers, you got to have skill. Beyond that, I don't care whether you're an agronomy major. <coughs> I couldn't care less. And uh, I mean, I hire people, good people, you know. Uh, people who demonstrated something in their life, they, they first of all, they would come in and ask for a job. That's a nice thing, okay? And make sure their fingernails are clean or whatever. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not, you know? I used to like, love to hire Mormon missionaries um, because you know, anybody goes out and knocks on doors and gets crapped on a hundred times a day and they stick it out, I like that, you know? That's a good characteristic right there. The guy that tell me, sold vacuum cleaners, you know? I meet people in stores that wait on me and they do a great job. I go, you did a great job with me. You don't even know who the hell I am. You know, why wouldn't you do a great job with somebody else? 
but I look for good, solid people. I don't care about talent. I don't care. I can teach them that stuff. I can't teach them the, the subtler skills things. Brooks, I want to thank you for coming. One okay. thing Brooks did not tell you when he made that joke about Colorado is that he actually lives in Colorado. And so we thought a little souvenir from Wyoming to Ooh, take baby. back to Colorado. Let's go drink this guy. Huh? <laughs> thank you.